everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, pronouns he, him, and I run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Emily Henry's People We Meet on Vacation, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row, stretching from Union Square to Astor Place. Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after 94 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, authors like Emily and Carly, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so truly appreciative of all of you. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us Emily Henry for an event for her best-selling novel, People We Meet on Vacation. Emily Henry is the number one New York Times best-selling author of People We Meet on Vacation and Beach Read. She studied creative writing at Hope College and now spends most of her time in Cincinnati, Ohio, and the part of Kentucky just beneath it. You can find her on Instagram at Emily Henry Writes. Joining Emily in conversation tonight is Carly Fortune. Carly is the executive editor of Refinery29 Canada. She's an award-winning journalist who's worked at Canada's top publications, including The Globe and Mail, Toronto Life, and Chatelaine. She's spent the last six years of her career in women's media and has a deep passion for connecting with female audiences. She lives in Toronto with her husband and two sons. Every Summer After, which will be published by Berkeley in May 2022, is her first novel. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Emily and Carly to the stage. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, Carly, really quick. Yeah. Is your cover public yet for your no. book? Okay, it's not it is not, but but uh, the word on the street is that uh, the U.S. edition uh, that cover will be out tomorrow. Okay, um, cool. On Friday, twenty nine. I was gonna hold up your book because I'm so lucky to have a very 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 early copy of Every Summer After, and I have it sitting in front of me. But I was like, I should check before so I don't spoil it. So I, I'm how do you do that? I don't even have that. <laughs> Um, I That's think yours. <laughs> I don't know how I how I managed that. I think that was like one of Amanda's last. We we share an editor for everyone watching, and so one of our editors' last acts before she went on maternity leave was like, "I need to get this book to you. It's so good, and I'm so excited. I just started reading it, and so obviously I will not be giving spoilers like a full year before your book comes out, <laughs> but." the main character is drinking Aperol spritzes and considering getting bangs on the first page. And I was just like, this is my person. Like, this is my favorite main character. Are you drinking an Aperol spritz? We need to know. Yes, there Wonderful. she is. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, that This is not about me, but I am so thrilled that you're going to be reading the book. And I am even more thrilled that I am talking with you this evening because I am such a huge fan of yours. And um, I'm, a bit ner I'm a bit nervous. Like, I feel like I'm going to fangirl out on you. Um, no, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> like, Again, I'm two Aperol spritzes in, so you can do anything embarrassing. You can do cartwheels and I'll just think it's cool. I should have been Aperol spritzes in. <laughs> um, and I wanted to firstly give you a major, major congratulations on this book. Um, it debuted number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Now, Beach Read is back on the bestseller list um, and the book is just fantastic. Um, I, I just like, Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's really, I, I feel like everything when you start publishing is like surreal, but I don't normally experience like intense emotional reactions because it's like so surreal that it's just sort of like, oh, there's my book in a bookstore or whatever. Um, but when my editor and agent called me and told me that uh, people we meet on vacation was number one. I just started screaming, no, no, no. And that was like my instant reaction was like, as if somebody had come to my door to be like, there's been an accident. <laughs> like, it was just like, I couldn't process that. Um, so yeah, thank you to everyone who is here watching. Like, I mean, that doesn't happen because, you know, I mean, I believe in the book obviously, but that happens a lot. A lot of the reason that a book sinks or swims is because of books like 
or at bookstores like The Strand and all the indies especially that really um, push and support and make sure that their like small communities are fully aware of everything going on. So I'm just very, very, very appreciative. And I'm so grateful that you took the time out of your like summer holiday, I feel like to do this with me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm thrilled too. Um, now, I think some people who are joining us tonight are probably like me and have read this book multiple times, and then others are, will um, be just beginning their hands on it. So could you, to make sure we're all on the same page, just give us a little like quickie synopsis of people? Yeah, so, and I, and I will do the like this. It's, so, it's such a bright cover that the camera like can't even process it. There, yours looks better. Um, so People We Meet on Vacation is the story of Alex and Poppy, who are two mismatched best friends who meet in college and against all odds strike up this really special friendship and relationship that's just like nothing either of them has ever had, partly due to the fact that they just are so different that it's like, this should not work. Why does this work? Um, and over the years, their lives carry them off in very different directions because of their different interests. Alex goes to school forever, hoping he can become a professor, um, which is a very uh, competitive path. So he ends up teaching high school instead. And Poppy um, drops out of college and starts travel blocking and eventually uses that to sort of parlay into the world of um, like aspirational travel journalism. And so every year, even though they're in totally different parts of the world, they come together for a one week summer trip and that's how they keep their friendship going. Um, and so at the start of the book, it's actually been two years since their last trip because they had a weird mysterious falling out. Um, and Poppy is in this weird rut with her job and just feeling very burnt out and really ready for a change in her life. And she decides that the thing that's missing and the thing that will fix everything is if she can get Alex back on board to be her friend. And so she convinces him to take one last summer trip where she's just like trying to fix things, trying to plug up all the holes in their relationship. Um, so the book follows that trip and then their previous 10 trips interspersed throughout the present day timeline. And where did you get the idea for this book from? What's, what's your inspiration? I, I'm curious to hear your answer too. It's kind of funny because our books are like definite cousins. Like if you like people we meet on vacation, you absolutely do need to pre-order Ever Summer After because they are like weird cousins where it's, it's like, weird. you know that something was in the universe when we started writing these books. Um, so for me, the combination was sort of, I knew that I, I knew that I wanted to play with structure in some way, which I don't normally do. My books are usually pretty straightforward chronological order. Um, but I wanted to play with structure in some way that felt kind of comparable to like one day or something like that. Um, and I also was trying to figure out a setting for the book and I didn't have any one setting really calling to me. And that normally is how I start a project is a, I have this very distinct setting in mind that kind of creates the atmosphere. And then the, the characters kind of come from that and, you know, the tone of the book. And I didn't have that. And so I was really just kind of listing out different places that I could set a book. And they were all um, places that I've traveled but have not lived. And I felt kind of like, I don't know, I, I'm kind of paranoid about writing a book set in a place that I haven't spent like at least six months where I can't just live as like a local. Um, I just felt like I'm not sure I'll pull it off. And so from there, I was like, well, you know, I could write about any of these places as a traveler. I know that experience fairly well. and that won't be inauthentic. It won't be me like trying to like sound like I know the cool spots in New Orleans, which I definitely don't. Like I was on Bourbon Street when I was there. Um, and so then it all kind of came together and it clicked and like I realized, oh, this is like, this is the structure. If it's a relationship told over trips, that makes perfect sense. And it also immediately was exciting to me because I think when you travel with someone, you see them at their very best and their very worst. And it's like this really intense, like when you take a trip with someone you're not super close with already, it's like within 22 hours, you're just like, wow, we've reached a new level. Like I know a lot about you that I didn't know before. So I thought that it would be a really good way to go really deep with a relationship and to really build a lot of intimacy and also to see how these people are different in different places. Because I think, I mean, that's so much, of I think why we travel is we just want to like access other parts of us that it can be really hard to tune into when we're just having our mundane 
daily routines that, you know, every day is the same. Well, I'm so uh, fascinated to hear that you have visited all of the places that you write about in the book, because I was, I was really, really curious as I was reading it. Um, I lived in uh, Victoria, British Columbia uh, for a year. And uh, what, you know, Alex and Poppy's first destination is Vancouver Island um, and Victoria. And uh, they go to Tofino. And I was just so impressed by how you captured it. And so the whole time I'm like, how, like is, she, is she researching travel? But like, how are you doing this? And I was thinking about when I went to New Orleans, I couldn't, I couldn't write I couldn't remember how you captured <laughs> the place. Yeah. You capture um, these locations so beautifully. Thank you. Well, I, okay, so I will say some of the trips, it's like, I, I think the Victoria trip and, and Tofino and all that, I remember pretty well. Um, it wasn't all that long ago. And I feel like that was like my honeymoon actually. So it's really funny because there's a lot of things that came straight from that trip, but obviously a lot of things <laughs> did not because it was like me and my husband. Um, but some of the other trips, it was like, I already knew I was going to be writing this book. And so I have like weird, almost unintelligible to me now at this point, notes in my little notes app on my phone that are just like small things. Like this is such a small specific thing that I probably could have found in, on Google, but I don't know if I would have noticed. And I don't even know if the final, de if the detail made it into the final book, but when they're in Tuscany um, or when we were in, I was in Tuscany, like the thing that I noticed the most was probably like, well, the lighting, which I feel like in every movie that portrays Tuscany, it's like golden lighting. So that was like, okay, that's real. Um, but also like this house we were staying in had all of this lavender and I had just never seen so many like fat, fuzzy bumblebees just zigzagging through the lavender. And I like wrote that down. It's such a small, not essential detail, but it was a really vivid thing that will like the smell of lavender will always make me think of Tuscany now. So little tiny details like that, I think are for me, at least as a reader, like really what make a place come to life. And there are people who are so good at research that like they can write an entire book set somewhere and you're like, oh, I can feel it. And then you talk to them and realize they've never been there. Um, but I'm just so daunted. I, I don't know if it's the imposter syndrome in me where it's like somebody's going to come up and be like, you don't know what you're talking about. And I even think, you know, with writing about writers so often, I think that's partly why it's like, yeah, I can interview a bunch of doctors, but I am not a doctor. And like, ultimately, I don't think I will write about a doctor's mind as well as I will write about someone who is a writer or some kind of at least like storyteller in some way. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I love that you were pointing out uh, the importance of specific details, because I think that is one of the things that you do best, both in terms of the setting, but also, um, you know, Poppy's family is extremely specific. And uh, even more so, Alex and Poppy's relationship is, is super specific. And I think that's one of the things that really makes it work because they're, they have an odd couple dynamic. So you need to show that their relationship makes sense and you have created for them this kind of like secret language. Like it's, it's not just banter, it's like, uh, like inside references and jokes and recalling what happened before in the present. And Poppy can read Alex's facial expressions that he makes two expressions at the same time. Uh, why was that like why was that important to you and how, like how did you do that that is I mean that was sort of the magic of this book like I feel like every book has like something that you're like why did that go so smoothly and then like a lot of things that you're like why was that so horrible um but I think I think that the joy of having this like cyclical um structure where it's like you're jumping kind of forward to the present and learning new things about these characters and then going back in time and realizing why that thing like really mattered. Um, I think that made it really, really easy to build those like running jokes because it's like you're setting it up and then you're like, because you know, because you've just immersed yourself in this, you have those little moments, you have those inside jokes. And again, like some of them really are like saint, like jokes that actually did come from real life and from trips I took with my spouse or with friends or whatever. Like, you know, I don't know, like somebody actually did message me who I think lives in Victoria and was like, 
I've been to the Empress and I've seen that $21,000 bear sculpture. And like, that was a real sculpture. And it was a real thing where my husband and I were just like bedraggled and we both look about 16 years old. And so we always like, things never like like never happen like this for us but this girl was earnestly trying to sell us a twenty thousand dollars sculpture for like 25 minutes and we kept being like yeah i mean <laughs> we don't have any money at all and she she did say like well you know people don't plan for art but when something speaks to you and and so that really was like for the rest of that trip was like a running joke of like does this speak to you because we just thought like how funny for like a twenty thousand dollar bear sculpture to speak to you to the extent that you're like I don't care that I have like two, $200 in the bank account, like get me a credit card. I need this bear. Um, but it's also weird because like sometimes I'm writing and just no jokes are happening and I feel like the most unfunny person on the planet. And sometimes I'm writing and it really is like that magical feeling of when you're hanging out with someone who has this like perfect, uh, this perfect kind of um, reflect reflective capability for you where you can just bounce things back and forth forever and you just feel like oh you make me my funniest self and whatever and for whatever reason Poppy and Alex just kind of gave me that inside of myself while I was writing so it was like I just got to keep setting myself up for whatever jokes were kind of coming to my mind um and so I don't like have a way you know when I'm giving like writing advice that's like a thing that I get asked asked about a lot and I don't feel like I have a really concrete answer other than I always tell people to watch a lot of tv <laughs> And I also like, don't think about conversations as like gently tossing a baton back and forth and like taking turns. I really think of it as like a tennis match sort of where it's like, or like maybe more like table tennis where it's like, you don't want to actually score because it's just like the feeling of success is when you keep going long enough for it to feel like we're good at this. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that dialogue is like, it's my favorite thing to do. And I think that the way that I think about it is just very much either like a push and pull or like this, you know, kind of hitting something back harder or in a weirder direction than the person's expecting you to or whatever. And I think that's like just a really fun place to play in as a writer. For sure. Um, I just want to point out to everyone that we are going to be taking audience questions. We're going to do it at the end um, of the Q&A around 7.45. Um, so you can pop the, if you pop those into the Q&A section, that will um, make things easy on us. But um, promise we will, we're not ignoring you. Well, yeah. we are, but we won't forever. <laughs> it's not permanent, ignore it. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, so P Poppy and Alex, their, their um, dialogue, their kind of like insideriness, that was, that was easy for you, this book. What was hard? Ooh. I think what was hard for me with this book, which is sometimes, I, I think to an extent it's, it's hard with every book, but I think one thing that was really hard was just making it both believable that there's a reason that this might not work and to still feel like a happy ending that they're like deciding, you know, whether, I don't know, like, I, I guess we're going to go spoil, spoiler light, um, even knowing this is like essentially in the romance genre. Um, but I think with any time you're writing a love story, like that's the biggest challenge in, in the like emotional arc, because there are a lot of, or I guess the stereotype, I don't know if it's actually accurate, but I feel like the stereotype of the romance genre is that like third act misunderstanding. Um, and it's weird because it's like, I definitely use that. And I, I have used that in my first two books. I don't know if I have used it in my next one, but I use that and I think that's real and I think that's valid. But I also think it's really important that there is an actual question of why this can work and I, or whether this can work. And I think with Poppy and Alex specifically, you know, so many people were like, why wouldn't they just be together right in the beginning? Like these people like love each other so much. Um, but to me, like, I just really wanted to develop their friendship in a way that felt like these two people love each other so much and need each other so much that if they could no longer be in each other's lives, like that would be basically the worst thing that would happen. And when you're already that close and you decide to cross that line, for most people, there is no going back from that. Um, partly because the nature of their relationship is they're taking these week long trips. And so if both of them want to end up in stable relationships with whoever, like you're asking, you're already asking a lot of your partner to be like, hey, is it cool if, you know, 
I, I guess now we found out that Steve Jobs was doing that all along. Like he was taking a trip with his like ex-girlfriend slash best friend once a year, whatever. Um, but it's asking a lot of your partner to be like, is this okay with you? Like I have this super close, intense friendship that's like predates you by years. And you know, I just need you to be cool with it. It's asking a lot. And then if you add in like, also we tried to date for like, you know, a year and a half and it fell apart. Some people can handle that, but not everyone can handle that. Um, and so I just, I, I think the big thing was I really wanted that third act disagreement to feel like a big enough thing. I really, I really needed it to feel like there are real reasons these two people might not work together. And I think in real life, that's like such a common thing. You can love someone so much and still think like, what do we do if I want you, but I also want this life that is not what you want. Like how, how do you make that work? Um, yeah, it's, I, I just, that was the big struggle it was like, I want people to want them to be, be together very badly, but I also wanted readers to understand what the huge risk of taking things further would be. And because we, this book is told from Poppy's perspective, we have a, a really good idea of why it can't, this relationship can't happen from her point of view. Um, what it, like, we, we get a bit of Alex's um, take on this, but not completely. Like, what is his problem? And is his problem the same as Poppy's? I don't think his problem is the same as Poppy's. I think partially it is. I think that they both know like this really, this matters more to me almost than any other relationship in my life. And so that makes it this sacred like family bond. And if you, you know, try to make it happen in a romantic sense and it doesn't work, you've just like cut out a member of your family potentially. But I also think I, I was talking to some, someone else who had read the book and they, I think really nailed it in a way that I hadn't even seen clearly, which was, like they were like Poppy you know thinks she's too much for Alex and Alex thinks he's too boring for Poppy and I think that that's part of it I think that he you know comes from this really kind of like repressed upbringing and he's very stable and steady which is great and he also has a secret goofiness which is great but at his core he's a pretty traditional guy and um or you know like not that he's like a traditional guy he's like a traditional person so that was like you know one of the one of the first starting points for the book aside from the others i already mentioned was wanting to play with this when harry met sally dynamic but from the very beginning i knew i wanted some of harry and sally's attributes specifically to be swapped so i knew i wanted a female lead who was a little bit flightier and louder and more obnoxious and didn't take things quite as seriously in the beginning and was just sort of like drifting over life, you know, like, oh, I could date him for a while, whatever. Whereas I wanted the male lead. I wanted Alex to be someone who has always craved that kind of stability. That's what he wants to build. He wants to rebuild this sense of family that he lost at a really young age where he's got this person that he can count on. Um, and that's also part of the, the, you know, the third act, it's not even just like a misunderstanding, but the third act conversation is like, can you count on Poppy? Like that's terrifying to Poppy to have someone count on her when she's used to being able to just up and go and kind of run from her problems. So to have the person she loves and values most needing something from her, I think is innately terrifying. And you posted on Instagram when the first book, when the book first came out that you were worried people would not like Poppy. Yes. Um, why? There were two different reasons. One, I think, Poppy is, um, she's, she's very goofy, but she's also, also kind of pushy. Like I really, really relate to her. And I think especially when I was younger, I was more like her. Um, but, but her sense of humor is like, a lot of it is just kind of like making Alex uncomfortable, which unfortunately like is a dynamic I also love with some of my friends where it's like, this is fun, we're having fun, right? Like I'm kind of pushing, like pushing your buttons and like teasing you and whatever. But then the other thing honestly was that it's funny because now we've hit like six different things where I'm like the first thing that like created this book. And I am curious to hear if your writing process is similar to that or not. But it really, for me, always feels like these are the six things I'm thinking about. And suddenly they all snap into place and I understand what the book is. Um, so the emotional arc, like the thing that really brought this book together for me was thinking about the concept of achieving your goals. And for me specifically like publishing and feeling like what now? And like, 
just this, this surprising feeling of emptiness or dissatisfaction or even depression that can kind of come after like the high high of, you know, getting the thing that you've wanted for your whole life. And I think that's, luckily I've, I've talked to a ton of people since reading who really, really, really related to Poppy being in that position. Um, but I think when you're still striving and working so hard and you're not getting where you want to go, it can be so frustrating and hurtful when like your friends who have had things click together in a way that you haven't yet are sort of like complaining about it. You're like, oh no, I have to like do, I have to go on a book tour or whatever. And they're just like, yeah, poor you, whatever. Um, and so I think part of it was just a fear of people thinking that Poppy was really spoiled because I think it's so easy to, to disregard feelings when somebody's life like looks good on the outside and to think like you have no right to be unhappy or depressed um, or un dissatisfied or whatever. And, and I just, you know, I also wrote this book before the pandemic came out. So I didn't know that like, I was gonna be writing about a travel writer being like, I'm sick of my job. Well, people, people were like a year into not traveling. So there was just like a lot going on that was like, how are people going to react to Poppy? And I'm really, really grateful that people have, for the most part, um, either really loved her or at least been like patient enough to stick with her and get to know her and understand where she's coming from. And I think that there are people who just will not be able to enjoy Poppy and that's also totally fine. But I just was like, it's going to be 80%, 80% of readers are going to just think Poppy is so annoying and spoiled. And I'm just very relieved that's not what happened. Uh, speaking about writing, about traveling, um, before the pandemic and the book coming out like smack dab in it, were you like, what, what were you thinking about? Were you like, this is either going to be excellent because everybody wants to escape or it's going to be terrible and people yeah. are going to not want to read about somebody yeah. else? <laughs> I, it was that exact conversation. Actually, um, some of the editorial conversations in like very small ways shifted the book, like in the opening chapter in a couple of other moments, there were there were times that not only talk, you know talked about kind of romanticized travel and this is what travel can do for you and whatever, but it but it would say things like only traveling can do this like you can only get this out of traveling and um, there were a lot of like small tweaks where in a kind of post travel world that didn't feel like something worth saying because it just felt like salt in the wound and also like the world changed and you realized like you, yes, you can get those things out of travel, but if you can't travel, you're going to have to find other ways to feel those things and to open yourself up and to like learn new things about yourself and all of that. Um, and honestly, I think if the, if the vaccines hadn't started rolling out, like before the book came out, I don't know if people would have enjoyed the book as much because I mm -hmm. think there would have been a lot of people who would have just felt like this is so far outside of our reality. Like, I don't know when I'll get to do this again. And like, luckily there was at least a summer of like, not normalcy, but you know, feeling like you could take a weekend away without like being so paranoid and like bleaching your hands all the time or whatever. So you landed at the perfect moment between like vaccines yes. and Delta. Delta. <laughs> Yes, yes. And now it's like, I don't know, it's really, I'm curious too, like, are you, I imagine you're working on a follow up, even though your first book is not out yet. Yes, yeah, I yeah. am. Yeah. I've been working on it this summer. And is it like, do you find, I mean, have you been answering the question of whether to acknowledge COVID or are you just sort of sidestepping it or what's, I mean, that's like an ongoing conversation. Yeah, I, I am not, I think I'm not going to I don't really, I'm so sick of it. I'm no. you know, just in it. I'm sick, kind of sick of it. I think I might flick at it. Yeah. Like just maybe there'll be a line or two. It's like, oh, did, like, is this? Yeah. Anyway, it's I, like the I, alternate I universe where COVID was just like actually the two weeks long thing that we thought it was. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I just don't, for the story that I want to tell, it, it's not helpful. So yeah. Like it doesn't, I don't think will add anything um, enjoyable. Yeah. I think it's really That's funny good. watching some of the movies and you know that were coming out even before vaccines were out where it was like people pivoted very fast and were telling pandemic stories and I was just like who is green lighting this where is the money for this coming because I yeah I'm, I'm with you so you're you're staying away from for thing. now yeah yeah for now we'll see what next year looks like and but for now it's like I guess all of my books forevermore take place in like 
2019. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the dedication in this book, which reads, I wrote the last one mostly for me, this one's for you, and the last one being Beach Read. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so Beach Read, I, I really did, I wrote that book, like, not intending to sell it. I didn't know that that was, like, a book that could be sold, um, it was kind of my like palate cleanser in between other projects. And I was, I wrote it in 2016. So it was like a few years ago. And um, honestly, like I just was very disillusioned <laughs> with 2016. And it really, you know, I was really struggling with like kind of the way that I thought people were. Like I had spent my whole life thinking like most people are good in the very specific way of like empathetic, compassionate, um, progress minded, whatever. I just felt very like, I was just very surprised by the world and I was just feeling like just depressed. Um, and Beach Read was like my escape. It was like the book that I didn't tell anyone I was working on. Like my husband didn't know about it. My agent didn't know, know about it. None of my writer friends knew about it. And I just would shut myself in my office and give myself a couple hours a day to do this thing that I wanted to do. And um, to just feel good. <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, I meant for it to be this like very happy book, but then all of this kind of dark stuff crept in. And I think it was kind of my safe way of like still exploring things that I was thinking about, but then feeling like I was doing it in the confines of this like very safe, warm genre that I have come to love deeply. Um, so when I wrote that book, there was no, I had no reader in mind and I had been publishing YA for a couple of years. So I had lost that feeling of what it is to write without thinking about what people will like or not like. And it was the most blissful writing experience I've had since before publishing to just make something and not, not care if anybody else would like it to just feel like I want this and I like this and it's like a good time. So that was amazing. But then when I started working on people we meet on vacation, I knew like I had watched Beach Read kind of start to gain like a little bit of momentum, even though it wasn't out yet. And I knew like this book is probably going to have like a much wider readership than I've ever had. And I was seeing like a ton of support from booksellers and librarians and just like early reviewers really kind of going hard for the book already. And I'm sorry if you can hear my dog snoring like ir irritably at me. Um, but I just was watching people really like support this in a way that I hadn't seen in my career, but also in like a lot of my friends' career, like careers. It was just this very rare gift. And so I knew like when I write my next book, this is going to be a totally different experience. There are going to be people waiting for it. There are going to be readers for it. And it felt like I wanted to give people the exact reading experience that Beach Read was for me as a writing experience. Like I wanted to be like, here is something happy and safe. And this is for you. Like Beach Read was for me. That was my, that was kind of like my comfort blanket or whatever. It was like a thing that was getting me through a hard time. And with people who meet on vacation, I was like, I want to stuff this with things that will make people happy. And you know, I, <laughs> and then afterward, I was like, but wait, is Poppy too annoying? So that was like kind of the like emotional um, roller coaster that I was on. Um, and can you, before we jump into questions, can you tell us about, um, so you have another book coming out next year. You're, I'm, you're working on another book now, but can you tell, tell us about your book that's coming out next year, Book Lovers? Yeah, I'm so happy I can actually talk about it now. Um, so yeah, it also comes out in May. So hopefully Carly and I will get to do an event and I will get to interview you about every summer after. Um, Book Lovers is definitely in the same like world and genre as my first two books. Um, it's about uh, Nora and Charlie. Nora is an agent in New York, literary agent who is like, just sort of like the, I'm trying to think of like what exactly I mean. The starting point for this book really was Nora's character, which was like, I want to write about the woman who's always getting dumped for like the Meg Ryan character. Um, so like the Parker Posey of You've Got Mail, um, or just like the city woman in every single Hallmark movie who's like 
I don't care, Gregory, you need to fire them. Do your job, close the small Christmas tree farm. I don't care that he's got a pretty daughter who's nice to you. So I wanted to take that character who's like really good at her job, always like yelling into her cell phone while like on a treadmill or in her case a Peloton, like angrily eating salads. And um, I wanted to take her and have like, and show things from her side of view, like her getting dumped over and over again because she's like not, the sweet like rom-com lead she's like not the innocent ingenue on the christmas tree farm um and so she kind of like because of her sister and through some weird uh circumstances ends up kind of going on this trip to north carolina that's supposed to be like her like small town romance novel experience or her hallmark movie experience where she's supposed to be like i'm gonna end up like shoveling hay and like let my hair down and you know wear some flat shoes or whatever. But while she's there, she almost immediately runs into her nemesis from back in New York, Charlie, who is an editor who turned down her book that has kind of made her careers um, a year before. And she has hated him ever since because he was very rude about it. And she runs into him there and is like, what are you doing here? And he's like, what are you doing here? And that's all I guess I can really say because it doesn't come out for a very long time. Um, but I'm really excited about it. Again, I'm sort of like, I think everyone's gonna hate Nora, but hopefully I'm wrong again. She's just a lot, she's intense. <laughs> we don't we don't wanna like a character, like a character can't be perfect. It's not, it's not fun. I don't, I don't personally, but I do feel like sometimes when I really love a book, I go straight to Goodreads to be like, I wanna see what everyone else thought. And it's like, oh, I'm shocked. Like everybody hated this character who I really enjoyed. Um, so I think I'm just always like, waiting for that but I agree I like a character with some flaws I like a character who does the wrong thing because that's what's interesting like in your own life you spend so much of the time trying to do the right thing so when you're reading it's fun to watch someone mess up and see how they deal with it or make like make a decision that you wouldn't make yeah absolutely okay I'm gonna ask one one question before I turn turn it over um I one of the things that I really look like when I love a romance book I think one of the elements that it almost always has is that the uh, two main characters are in lots of scenes together if I, I find like when I'm not loving a book it's because they're they're apart too many times like I want to see them interact like that is essential for me and your books like totally do that for you as a reader and a, and a writer what are kind of like the the magic ingredients do you think to a good love story that is such a good question and no one has ever asked me that so i've never had to think about it um oh my gosh that is such a good question and so now i'm just thinking about some of my favorite love stories and i think honestly partly for me it is it is those flaws one of my favorite books that I've read in the last five years, um, which it is fairly steamy for anyone who doesn't like that, but The Luckiest Lady in London by Sherry Thomas. It's a historical romance novel. And it was like, I hadn't really read historical romance. My friend was like, you must read this. And it has this really intense, um, like angst factor, but it's because the two characters have both had hard <laughs> childhoods that have created, you know, kind of like their mental patterns that they're kind of working against. And they're both sort of survivors. So they kind of do like scrappy underhanded things because they're just sort of like, I'm out for me, you know, no one else is watching out for me. But I think that the feeling of imperfection is so important to me. And sometimes like I can really enjoy a romance where the characters feel pretty much like they're just great all the time. I can really enjoy that. Um, but I think what really like gets its hooks into me is when I can see what someone has done wrong and still really love them. Like it's very, very, very rare. And again, in romance, this is the thing that I know a lot of people can't handle, but, um, when a book can even have like infidelity in it and I can still be rooting for the couple, that's like, they've done something really well to be like, this person made this kind of mistake and you still understand their heart and you believe in them and you believe that they could get through this or whatever. So I think it really, I do, I really love a couple more for their imperfections. Um, and then I also think sense of humor is just like, if it's, you know, if it's not really angsty, I want it to be really funny. And I think everybody has a different sense of humor. So that's tricky. Sometimes people are like, this book was so funny. And I am just like, this isn't for me. It's, it's funny to someone, but it's not funny for me and that's okay. Um, 
but there are some writers. I, uh, Vari McFarlane is one of my favorite, um, like kind of women's fiction with love stories in it, like writer. And she is one of very few writers who just like every book will make me laugh aloud like one time at least. And I just never really laugh aloud while I'm reading. So I hugely recommend her. And I think it's, yeah, it's like kind of dark. There's like real life grit in it, but it's also so funny. So humor or angst and jerks, <laughs> jerks that we root for. Or the combination is like the ideal situation. If you can like, and, and Varya McFarlane is the perfect like example of that where it's like people die, things are not like sunny and perfect, but also she'll like make me laugh until I'm crying. <laughs> All right, that's awesome. Now I am going to attempt to operate the Q&A function. Um, guys, you can drop your questions into the Q&A section and I am going to um ask Emily as many questions as possible let's go who would you cast as Poppy and Alex in a tv slash movie adaptation I have no idea um everybody can feel free to in the chat say who they would cast and interact with each other because I really don't know I the go-to answer I've been giving just is which is just sort of like here's someone who's small and like chirpy um I've been saying like Mae Whitman or Jane Levy for poppy because they're just small and perky but I really I don't really care that much like I feel like I don't need the characters to look at all like they look in the book they just need to have the right dynamic and I don't know <laughs> so I'm always curious to see who other people say but I don't really have an answer myself um okay would you rather live uh, in Poppy and Alex's story or in January and Gus's story? And January and Gus are um, our, our heroes in Beach Read. I think almost any other time in my entire life, I would probably see January and Gus's world. But I think that kind of like feeling of missing doing things right now is like too overpowering. And so I would probably go with uh, Poppy and Alex. But overall, like, yeah, I want to live on the shore of Lake Michigan and like have the beach to myself in the dead of winter, which is January and Gus's situation. Yeah, that's, that sounds pretty divine. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite scene or moment between Poppy and Alex? I have a few. I really love, I really love when Poppy sprains her ankle in Vail. Um, and, and I won't say what happens after that for anyone who hasn't read yet, but I really love that scene. Um, and that was just really, fun to write and somebody uh, saying slow Laura's hands oh yeah and I think that was a thing where it's like I'm not positive if I've had done that exact thing but it it just felt like I've in, in some universe I've done this in some universe I've been like crying and then like what's wrong with my hands um yes I love that scene and I also I do love I do love the final kind of like scene um outside of the little like dive bar in Ohio is like one of my favorites too. Uh, perfect. Okay, is there any news on what, whether people we meet on vacation will be coming to the big screen either as a mini series or a movie? I literally am like, you're, <laughs> it's like a weird thing when, <laughs> when you are a writer because your answer is just always like, I'm not allowed to say and it's like, that could mean almost anything, but my, but yes, I hope so. There's no guarantees, but I do think like whenever you really want to book as a movie, all you can like do is just keep encouraging your friends to read it and all of that, because all that excitement really does help make that so much more realistic when there's that kind of like natural support. So the answer is hopefully, and if I, if, and when I'm allowed to like talk about it, um, if there's something concrete, I will be posting about it like obnoxiously often. So you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> um okay what books are you reading right now oh my gosh okay I just read Sherry LaPena's um Not a Happy Family which is a thriller or maybe not thriller like a suspense a mystery um and I also just read I've kind of been on a kick with like darker things so I also just read Verity by Colleen Hoover which has been like one of the big like book talk um books this year even though it came out a few years ago and after reading it it's like I completely understand like I had to take a couple of days off reading because there was just like brain melting out of my ears um 
And then romance wise, or not romance, women's fiction wise, um, I am reading uh, Jane Rosen's A Shoe Story, which comes out next summer, I think. Uh, she wrote, what is, Eliza Starts a Rumor, which is really fun and good. If you like, it's sort of like a lighter, um, big little lies kind of feeling. It's like, it's like upstate New York, this like, like cute town where everybody's like polished and has their nice houses and they're like cute little strollers and all of these women actually have like secret interior lives going on of course and are more complicated than they seem and they form friendships and it's it's just really fun and I think Jane is a screenwriter as well and so her books just like move very quickly so I'm reading her new one but I can't talk about it yet because it's not out. Perfect I am I have Verity on my my to like this is my next step I've got to read it I yeah it. I can't like tell I, like I, I recommend it being like I have no idea if any like anyone I'm recommending this to will like it but you will read it fast and afterward you will just be like wow she's, she's such a master she is she's incredible um okay if you could go on vacation with one of your characters, who would you choose? Oh, Poppy, for sure. So, so easily, Poppy. Like going on vacation with anyone else, we would just end up staying in like the room the whole time. And Poppy would be like, I know what, what we're doing and where we're going. You could just kind of follow her to whatever destination she'd figured out. And in a post COVID world, fingers crossed, yes. <laughs> where, where would you want to travel to next? Um, I am, as of now, Assuming that things keep going, I'm I'm sub, I'm going to Edinburgh next summer um, for a rare like book signing, mm. um, which is this like romance group that puts on these big signings. And I've never been to Scotland, so I'm very 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 excited to do that. And I really hope that it actually happens. Oh, I hope so too. It's Scotland's on my bucket list. Um, Okay, since you didn't start in the romance genre, you when your um, first books were in the YA space. Um, what was it like to move to romance from YA? And will you continue to write in both genres? Yeah, okay, so I think when I moved into romance, I, I was just like so intimidated and really worried that I was gonna just feel like I was like, I don't know, imposing on people or stepping into their like terrain and taking up space and whatever. And I am not kidding when I say I have never met any other like division of people or any other people group that is as uniformly nice and generous as romance writers. Like I am not kidding. I have yet to meet a single one who was anything less than like the nicest person on the planet. Um, and it really makes me so happy to be where I am and be writing what I am. and so honored and like so grateful because again like a lot of those like more established romance authors were immediately so supportive to me and it just feels like maybe there is some kind of like competitiveness but I have yet to see any of it I just feel like everybody loves the genre so much and is like very excited to talk about the books that they love and to boost each other and you know I think romance readers are so voracious that there is more of this feeling of like, there's not as much of like a scarcity mentality. I feel like there's more of a like, a rising tide lifts all boats. Like, I mean, if you, if I like a, one romance book, then I will immediately look for other books just like it or that sound like it. So um, it's amazing. I love it so much. Um, my dog is just crying for some reason, but I also really love YA and I think I will probably write more in YA. I just needed, I just was excited to tell coming of age stories about 30 year olds. And I had felt like I'd kind of said everything I had to say about like that 17 year coming of age um, for, the, for the time being. And so I fully expect to someday do some more YA, but I'm just like really loving writing about 30 year olds right now, like having their like second crisis. <laughs> Well, we're, we're loving it too, but I'm also a huge YA fan. So um, I'm excited for the day when you dip your toe back, back in that world. Um, somebody is asking for a quick synopsis of Every Summer After, which is my book. So I just, I'm gonna, gonna take it away really quickly. I haven't done this before guys in public. Um, so my book is about childhood uh, best friends who, um, grew up together in cottage country. Uh, my main character, Percy, has a cottage and she spends summers there and meets um, 
this boy named Sam who lives next door and they have a big, big falling out. And we um, start the book um, with them reuniting for the first time after 12 years not talking to each other. Um, and so the book is like weird, weirdly similar in a way to people we meet in vacation in that it's told in now and then timelines and we're trying to figure out what went wrong between these two people who we think are like, like why can't these two make it work? Um, and, and that's my book, very quickly. And what I've read of it so far is so good. And so again, if, I mean, they're not, obviously they're not the same book because even if we had the same exact outline, it wouldn't have wound up being the same thing. But if you like people we meet on vacation, you should definitely pre-order every summer after for sure. Agreed. Please do that. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. What authors uh, did you grow up aspiring to and has that changed? Oh yeah. I mean, the weird, okay. So the weird thing is like, obviously right now it kind of feels like what everybody agrees that I'm pretty good at is romance and that is not at all like even in college I wouldn't have believed someone if they had told me like that's what's going to really take off for you um I hadn't even read a romance novel in college um I really grew up loving genre fiction and I specifically loved sort of like genre bent stuff that was sort of um, you know, magical realist or fabulous or um, with sci-fi elements. And I think, you know, a couple of the earliest um, writers that I like really loved and like realized what books could be um, in my reading world were probably like Mad Madeline Langle and Lois Lowry and people like that who were kind of, you know, doing just like weird, weird, like sort of sci-fi sort of fantasy that's like really just about people like the nature of humanity and the universe um and that's like very much like I feel like visible in my YA but hasn't been in my books for adults yet um so yeah but but I I do write like a little bit of everything and my hope is someday I'll be like allowed to publish whatever I want in every genre um but yeah the I people feel like that day is is uh is here Emily I don't there it is. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I definitely want to keep giving the people what they want to like, that's, you know, like I understand what a gift it is to have this career and I love writing romance novels. So I'm going to keep doing that, but I also would love to do some stuff that's a little bit weirder and a little bit more polarizing. I think. I'm into it. Um, somebody wants to know if Gus, this, this is Gus Dietrich, is based on a real person and they say they're asking for a friend. Oh, I so wish that he was so that I could just like slide in the phone number. No, honestly, I think Gus is sort of, I think Gus and January are sort of both just like parts of my brain. <laughs> they were like at war with each other at that time. But I do think like I had friends in college who, um, you know, I, I studied creative writing in undergrad and I had friends who kind of went the more traditional route and who I didn't have like contentious relationships with the way that Gus and January did in college. But I definitely like had friends who now I'm like, I look at their careers and I'm like, oh, that's so interesting because, you know, we were kind of starting in the same place and doing similar things. And they went off and did this thing. And I went off and did this thing. And they they look so different on the outside, even though I think really the mechanics of it is all so similar. Um, so I think it was really kind of more just me me like at war with my own with my own expectations and like I said in college I hadn't even read romance and then I started publishing in YA and it was sort of like I take this thing seriously but I see how the world reacts to it and I always had this thing of should I have gone to grad school should I have been you know trying to become a professor should I have been like trying to publish in uh literary journals and all of that and I didn't take that route so it really is sort of just like me being like the two little talking, you know, angel and devil being like, could have had, could have had this career, could have had this career, whatever. Um, okay, here, here is the question that I also would like to know the answer to is, um, where is your top from? It is a full dress. Let me see if I can remember where I got it from. Um, I got this so recently that it is a, like just horrible that I don't remember. Um, I'm not gonna be able to see this, I don't think. It's a wrap dress. It was, I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm probably gonna just expose myself. You're gonna have to take us back there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Great event. 
I'm just like it's uh yeah I have no idea you guys I'm very sorry <laughs> <laughs> um what do you do when you get stuck as a writer Ooh, okay so when I'm actively drafting I don't take days off and I do hit at least 2,000 words a day and so that means um I see someone said it looks like D Diane von Furstenberg and it really does but it's not but I bet it's a knockoff because it really does. So that's where you should look if you want to find something like this. Um, but anyway, so when I get stuck while I'm drafting, I just make myself write. And <laughs> that sounds like kind of like a brush off answer, but, I but what I really mean is also my dog is licking my ring light right now and like looking <laughs> in my eyes, like preparing to tip it over onto my face, I think. Um, what I mean by that is I don't take days off. I hit that word count and usually nothing is happening when I do that, like the, the book is just nothing is happening. And so I've started talking to people about this as hiking around in your book. And by that, I mean, like, if you're stuck, you don't know what comes next, make try try this, it might not work for you, but try making yourself write 2000 words, where you just like send your characters to the grocery store, or like, have them literally go on a hike, which is an actual thing that I have had characters do and it never really makes it to the final book but what happens is I send the characters out to do something mundane and not important and eventually they just run into someone and it just like picks up steam and then I know like what needs to happen next um and that's really helped me to realize like so much of so much of my writer's block is just fear of failure. And so by just being like, okay, I'm gonna start out by failing, I'm gonna start out by writing this very bad scene that will get cut later, but I'm not gonna quit until I've hit this word count that's kind of extensive. That really gives me room to just like find something to dig into. I think that's excellent advice. Thank you for that. Um, hi, Sabir. I was just saying, I'm sorry to interrupt this like fantastic conversation. It was so much fun. Thank you both so much for such a fantastic hour. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Fun. Oh, no, absolute pleasure. This was just like a lot of fun uh, to our audience. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. If you haven't purchased people, we meet on vacation. I've dropped a link in the chat. I've also dropped a link for summer after next, as well as a pre-order link for book lovers. And with all of the recommendations we got tonight, I feel like you're going to have a good range of books to pick from if you're looking for something next. Well, on that note, thank you, everyone, and have a fantastic evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.